Father God in heaven, I just thank you for this amazing world that you've made that we get to talk about and study and live in and just be the benefactors of uh, your grace that you have poured out to us and help us to see it in more detail and bless our time together and all the seminars that are going on this afternoon. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be here. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Glad that you're here. And we're going to, well, there's a number of things that we're going to do this afternoon. I'm going to uh, talk to you about a project that's going on with Nathan Green. You can see some paintings that are here. I'm going to talk about that project. And then I have some chemical demonstrations that I'm going to do. I want to do a little teaching because that's what I do uh, at Andrews University. And we're going to learn something about the way God made this world. And I'll go into more detail when I get there. This is a little bit about me. I, uh, there's my lovely family. So I try to hide behind them because they're much better looking than I am. And, uh, and so I've been at Andrews uh, eight years, and I'm starting my ninth year here, and things are going well. And uh, I can't do what I do without my family. They're, my wife's very supportive. She's a biologist. We shouldn't hold that against her. Uh, no, she's a wonderful scientist, and, and so she uh, uh, helps me with those things. Um, before I, I was at Andrews, though, I did work in industry for a total of 10 years, so I, I, I come with some industrial experience, able to bring that into the classroom and see things uh, a little differently. So part of what I did was business development work in the chemical field. I actually run a business at Andrews on top of trying to do research and, and uh, some of the things that I'll be sharing with you today, and which is I'm trying to figure out how to be a chemical missionary, because I kind of feel being an Andrews and being an Adventist that how can I become a missionary for the Lord using uh, the talents and my knowledge? And it's uh, easy to want to be a preacher or an evangelist, but what can I do as a chemist? So I'm trying to think about how to be a chemical missionary, and you'll get to see some of that here today. And so these are some of the things that uh, I've been able to come up with. Uh, in fact, this summer I've been a camp pastor a couple of times. Well, that was really fun. So I would do some demos. Uh, and mainly object lessons, which is, which is fun to do. Uh, it's my, my, the, the thing that I really find important is how can I teach how God made this world and what can we learn about it? I go around and do sermons locally in the area. I'll go wherever, though. Uh, Vespers and children's stories, and uh, I've done some uh, week of prayer. And we did this really fun little thing uh, I call the science camp. I was asked by uh, the Eau Claire Seventh Amos Church there near Berrien, Springs that uh, there was a, the evangelistic series the Lake Union was doing uh, and I'm trying to unlock Revelation. And so they said, you, got, you and your wife, go do something with the kids. And they're like, oh, no, not the kids again. We have our own three as small ones. And I said, all right, I, you know, we, we're, instead of just trying to entertain the kids and, and do stories, we're going to run a science camp for them. And we're going to teach them about how God made this world. And, and I'll share a little bit with that in a second. And so we did a really fun science camp. And then, uh, of course, with my classes and anything, try to integrate what I'm seeing on how, how God made the, uh, the world. So I think there's some really cool things that we can do. They're not that hard, but we still need, I still feel like I need to train people wherever I go because we just don't think like a chemist uh, does. So I need to do a little bit of that. And so here's uh, my daughter. Uh, she's able to do some of the experiments. And... This was our enrollment. This was our theme here. You're an important element, and we did the elements of the periodic table. And we just went through each element that we could over, I think it was 17 nights, and we did 15 different elements. Some of them are exciting, so they had to go two nights. And while the enrollment for the evangelist, uh, evangelistic series was going down, our enrollment to our program was going up. So the kids are just having a great time. I think there's so many things we can do with science to pull in students' interest. And that, that's the fun part of it, but there's more to it. And that, to me, I'm trying to lay a groundwork when I'm dealing with young children. How can I get them excited about it, but train certain principles so that I can, I've got some other information that I want to give them later on, then hopefully I can. So uh, when it comes into thinking about faith and science, we hear a lot about how awesome this world is through biology. There's amazing animals that are out there. Uh, things about the giraffe and their neck, the bombardier beetle, and there's animals that defy evolution, and those are cool. And, and, uh, but I'm not that person to talk about those, uh, although I, I am getting into that a little bit more because they have some amazing chemistry that goes on in their systems. 
Then we'll often get a perspective from physics, uh, oh, how great the, the universe is and how big, and there's some amazing things there, but we often don't hear from the chemist and how this world is made and put together. We, there are a few things, and uh, I feel like there's a, missing, there's a missing link there that we can understand how God made this world, and we'll appreciate what he's done, and I think just live in, this, uh, live in the blessing that our world is, but we have to see it. And sometimes I have to teach and help you to, to see there because we, we just don't think like that. We don't think, but that's the connecting step because you can have all of the universe that you want, but all of the creatures and all of our world is made out of chemicals. And that's, to me, a chemical is not a bad word. That's just the molecules and stuff that we're made out of. Some people think there's, there's chemicals and there's natural stuff. No, there's just all chemicals and some are good and some are bad. All right, so in my looking of trying to see how God's put this world together, am I seeing a doorway there that leads into life like in a natural way, meaning without God's intervention, or do I see a lot of barriers there? And I'm going to, uh, I can't get into all of it because that would take too long, but I at least want to start laying some groundwork for you in the, in the thinking how I'm starting to see it. And I actually see a lot of barriers for life happening spontaneously. And, and this is in the, in the area of origins and how did life get started. And there's some real chemical barriers there. So we'll get into that. And, and the scientific community knows that there's huge chemical barriers that exist for life to spontaneously happen. And so they're throwing lots of money at it now. And it's called uh, you can see that there's a Center for Chemical Evolution, there's Origins of Life Initiatives, this is at Harvard. Uh, Nature's trying to have their own publications associated with Origin of Life. Uh, the National Science Foundation is creating centers in conjunction with NASA to put money towards the chemistry of understanding how life can happen. And if you're getting funding, what do you have to do to keep getting that funding? Does anybody know? <laughs> you got to hang on to your worldview, but you got to do something with all that money. You got to show progress by publishing. Whether it's right or wrong, you have to publish. And they are going to be, so we should be expecting it's happening that there'll be a lot of publications that are happening on the origins of life. Whether they're realistic or not, it doesn't matter. They have to publish in order to keep getting this funding. So there's millions of dollars being thrown at this initiative because it is a huge barrier to that world to an evolutionistic world view and the textbooks just gloss over it because there is no good explanation for it and uh, so I'm going to share a little bit but not too much in that but just want to know that this is a real battleground that is going on so uh, chemistry is at the heart of it because it's been ignored for a long time because we're still figuring out what chemistry really is uh, it's a it's a, a field that is constantly growing so where I come in and we're, uh, uh, this project that I want to describe a little bit now that's up in front of you. Uh, so uh, the secret is, so Nathan Green and I, you may know of Nathan Green and some of his artwork, uh, we go to church together. So we do live in the same area and we've become friends and he, he has a passion for science and for biology and uh, for life. He likes taking pictures of ducks and, uh, and painting them as well as the other things that you've seen. And so uh, we, we, we work together and he was commissioned to paint the seven days of creation. And as we were talking, we realized, well, this might be a good idea that uh, could we come up with some educational materials to go along with each day? And so this is where I'm coming in. Now you can see Nathan Green's uh, progress to date. He has finished uh, for, you know, pretty much, yeah, for the first four days right here. And you're welcome to come up afterwards and take a look at, in more detail, I'll actually show them on the screen here. And what I'm doing initially is to come up with a video, because uh, I can think better when I'm doing presentations, because that's, that's what I do all the time. So I've come up with a video that's about 10 to 13 minutes long for each day. I've already done that. Uh, and I try to hit some key topics that the day brings up, OK? Now, and you'll see as I go through this, some of my job is not to just prove creation 100%, but try to throw down these very important arguments that are out there and get them and get her, you know, I, so initially I'm trying to uh, create some of those materials for more of the upper elementary students, like fifth through eighth grade. So I, I gotta continue to think about how to make it simpler as we go through that. And so there'll be some written materials, 
um, and then some videos to go along with each day. And we'd love to get this information into all of our schools and churches. And, and wouldn't it be great? You can walk into a school and kids would just see these paintings day one, day two, day three, day four, and just get this impression. But not, not only this awesome visual art that's there and impress them in how God has made this world, but also they have some very strong scientific arguments that support this worldview that we have that's founded in scripture, first of all. And so um, I, I'm also trying to talk and interact with other uh, Adventist institutions that we have, uh, the Geoscience Research Institute, see what they have out there. Um, doing a little bit of work with uh, Carol Rainey down at Southern. Um, she's putting together some origins information. The Adventist Learning Community is a place where maybe some of this will end up. Uh, I know there's, a lot, there's origins discussion and materials that are out there. Uh, so we're partnering with the, the Heart Research uh, Center to you know, coordinate this and see where we, what we can do with this project to get it out there. And so I want to just share a little bit of how I see things from a chemistry perspective. You can see some of Nathan's. I'll put some of Nathan's work up here if you can't see all the way. So day one, and I think what's really cool about day one is, uh, besides being an awesome painting of God, uh, Jesus here, there's some mathematical equations. And we talked to physicists, and uh, I put in my two cents on some important equations that are there that are foundational to uh, the organization of our, of our world and our universe. And then some important structures in chemistry and biology. And those are sort of in the background. You can see that God's thinking about all of this from the beginning. And day two is, uh, day two is probably my favorite because that's where, uh, and where we're going to spend some time today talking about. You can see just God fashioning uh, uh, the atmosphere. And I want to show you that there's some real design to it and things that are unlikely to happen by chance. Day three, the, with the plants and land happening on day three, um, one of the, this is a good uh, little segue into something that uh, we're also thinking about doing is that with the artwork, it would be great to maybe uh, have a projection on here where we can overlay through a projection some additional information that's important. Uh, for instance, down here, I'll actually try to do it in my slides. Uh, there's a, a magnetic field and electric fields that go around the earth. And it would be interesting to see how we can overlay that with a video projection and then some amazing things that happen in the roots of the plants. Here we could put that down there, more things in the, in the sky, and then things associated with the moon. Of course, this is, it, it just makes you think of the eclipse that's happening. Yeah. How many, is anybody going to go see the total eclipse? Go find the total eclipse area and go watch it. What's that? It's August 21st, so you've got a few weeks to plan for it, but it's, uh, there's lots of stuff on the Internet. Some people have said if you just... You can't just watch the partial eclipse because that's just not doing it justice. And uh, so you, you have to go somewhere where the, the main swath is. So I think 3ABN Studios might be a good place, Southern Illinois. Uh, we can all just go there. And so uh, Nathan Green is currently working on day five and he's given us permission to show his composition. That, so he likes to put everything together in Photoshop and then he paints from, this, uh, from that. So this is his day five that, is, that he's working on right now. And then it's all the other work that he's got going on. And uh, so he's an amazing guy, and we appreciate what he, he's training his daughter in, so he can get an uh, assistant there. Uh, so this is what he's thinking about for day five, an, an amazing, I, I just, it's pretty incredible already just to think about what he's got in mind for that. So I really appreciate his vision, his artistic mastery there that he has. And so uh, trying to have the materials that I'm coming up with to interact with that. Uh, so, let, so yeah, those are some of the goals that I've already mentioned that we're just trying to see if we can generate some good, strong visual and educational materials to get into the schools and churches. And I'd like to try to do the educational materials at different levels. Uh, upper elementary, high school level, and then a collegiate level. So we can dig deeper. So there's always a foundation that we can lay and then it has some deeper information that we can get into. Uh, so that's where we're at right now, where you can see the progress right here. And maybe within a year's time, well, a lot more of it would be professionally put together and you know, releasing it some way. We gotta still think through some of that. So I'd love to talk with any of you if you're interested uh, in that. 
So that, that's the first part of my talk that I wanted to just give you an update of this project that's going on. And then this next part, I want to kind of get into why I'm a chemical missionary, what stirs my soul, and some of the things that I, that I do. I go around giving some talks, sermons, and like I said, uh, in summer camps and things like that. And so as, was, as I mentioned already, the battleground, man, it is really a battle out there, as I see it as, uh, from, a, uh, from my perspective as a scientist. Man, you cannot, if you do not follow uh, the mainstream scientific view, uh, you're in trouble. And I'm sure I've said enough things and said enough things on, uh, that have been recorded that uh, I probably are going to have a hard time publishing anything. That's all right. But the real, I see the real battleground is, um, you know, how are, how are we here? How is life here on this planet? Are we here by a designer, God's um, handiwork? Are we here just from a series of chance interactions of molecules colliding together at the right time and temperature and these sort of things? So I'd like to help train you today and to be thinking a little bit more from a chemical perspective. And because you guys already know how to do this, I just have to tell you. Uh, how to uh, and remind you of some ways to do that, and the things that motivate me are things that these some of these guys out there. Oh, these guys make me. So who are these guys? There's there's scientists and people who who. Um, well, they're not quite scientists. Uh, Bill Nye's not a science. So he's called the science guy. He's actually not a scientist. He's a high school science teacher, and so he's never done research of his own. But he's out there promoting science. And I can show you, and I'll, this is a few clips right here, but uh, Lawrence Krauss actually is a scientist, a theoretical physicist, and they have gone on record to say if, if you are teaching creationism, you are abusing children. Now, thankfully, nobody has taken them serious yet, like social workers and things. But I don't know, maybe it's a matter of time, because they would pull my children away. i got to share this with you <laughs> My son, he, he's nine years old, and he loves biology, and he loves all the animals, and especially the big teeth. And I found him one day in a Sabbath school room in our church. And he's up there, he's got all the kids sitting down in the, in the chairs, and he's teaching them about different types of sharks. And he's drawing them on the, on the whiteboard there. And then I, I come in there, like, oh, my son's, maybe he's going to be a biology teacher when he grows up. And he says, 50 million years ago, the sharks. And I'm like, no, you didn't. What? He goes, oh, yeah, no, I mean, thousands of years ago. And, I mean, and, and he has heard it from me many times. But yet our culture, there are so many messages that are getting into our children. And that's what motivates me as a parent is, how do, is it, what can we do to help combat this inundation of information that is just everywhere in children's books, in their cartoons, it's just everywhere. And that get, makes me upset, because even my son, who knows, it just, it's just, because that's what they, they read and that's what they hear millions and millions of years ago. Although we're finding dinosaur tissue, and that may be dating back to only 20, 30,000 years. Okay, that's what they're, and, and that's a whole other issue that I'm not gonna get into right now. They, that's not expected. But these guys are going on record that you should not be teaching creationism. So now we've got well-known science figures, some of them scientists, who are going on record many times, I have more of them saying, if you're teaching creation, that's child abuse. You cannot do that. You need to let the school system teach a certain way. And that's why I'm so happy for our Adventist education. I'm a product of that, so I'm very thankful. And, uh, and uh, we have a chance to combat that. Now, I've got it, and then there's another thing from another, uh, I'm actually, so I'm going to show a clip from Comedy Central, uh, because even they are tackling this issue of faith and science. So I'm going to show a little clip. This is, well, does anybody know who this famous scientist is right here? What's that? N this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think I have to go up to my computer here and play this clip. I think I got it going right here. So even on, so on Comedy Central, they, they're having this discussion between a well-known, he's also an astrophysicist. Uh, th this guy right up here is, um, is a pastor, and I'm not sure who this guy is. And this is the comedian moderator. And, and they're covering these issues on Comedy Central. And so this is just amazing to me, but this is what motivates me here. Does science for you uh, reveal 
I had to edit it a little bit. Of God or an existence of more awesome science? Well, any time mm -hmm. someone describes their understanding of God, mm -hmm. typically it involves some statement of benevolence mm -hmm. or, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or some kind of <laughs> kindness. Uh -huh. And I look out to the universe, yes, mm -hmm. it is filled with mysteries, but it's also filled with all manner of things that would just as soon have you dead. <laughs> like, like asteroid strikes and yes. hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and, and volcanoes and uh, disease, pestilence. There are things that exist in the natural world that do not have your health or longevity as a priority. All and so I cannot look at the universe and say mm -hmm. that, yes, there's a God and this God cares about my life. <laughs> Mm -hmm. At all. The <laughs> evidence does not support this. But, so, now listen to the so clapping. But in all fairness, Why are people but in all fairness you just yeah. described the Old Testament. No, it's precisely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pastor, help me out. Does, does science, is science a threat to religion or can they coexist peacefully? No, I think that God created science. So mm -hmm. for me, um, I, I don't think that exploring any of this stuff is bad. I think it's going mm -hmm. to lead you to exactly what you said. That a knowledge that something had to had to begin this and there's something more so mm -hmm. I love it I think that science is awesome I don't think they wore at all yeah. I do feel it's I do feel that the more we learn though mm -hmm. the more it yeah he doesn't have much good to say all right so it, you can I mean the clapping for Neil deGrasse Tyson oh, I can't believe in a god he is so the, 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 this god if there is he's so mean and arbitrary and just out there uh, genocidal and they're and people have just gone on with all these very negative descriptions. And I think that is such um, a wrong view. And that's what I want to show you today. This guy is not looking at the world. He's ignoring the things that are right in his face. And I want to show you why he is so wrong. And how could he miss the things that are right in front of your face? And this whole battle between, you know, creation or, you know, God and, and chance and evolution... I think both sides, you know, we, we all feel like we're out fighting against Goliath. We, we all want to find that one little stone. I heard Dr. Hayes say something, and that's going to strike down and slay the giant of evolution. And, you know, we got our evolutionists over there going, oh, man, I got this one little argument that is going to slay that giant of Christianity, of creation, and we are just going to... And so both sides actually feel like we're David, I think. But you know, the Israelites and the Philistines, that was not their only battle. No, they had battled before and they battled after. And so we got to be careful when we have, oh, I've got this one argument that I heard at ASI from Dr. Hayes that proves it all. That's not what I'm trying to do here. There is a groundwork that needs to be laid in a way that we think. And there is not one argument. Maybe there is one argument for you. I've heard from a number of pastors and doctors and they, oh, this thing proves it for me. Okay, well, that's great. But um, that's not how scientists think. We're looking at where does the weight of the arguments, where did they land? And it is not a fair ground anymore. You, we think, and often in our schools, we're saying, well, let's carefully look at both of these sides here. Evolution says this, and creation says this, and this seems wrong and right here, and this seems wrong and right here, and where is the balance? And we, we're expecting that the rest of the world is doing that, and they're not. They've said, creation, you're done. We're done with that old thinking. It's evolution, and how can we make this better? So, it, so there is no more balanced thinking anymore. It's done. If you, if you even think that there's an argument to be made for crea uh, creationism, you're wrong. And so evolution is science. It's almost fact. And if you have anything to say against it, you will lose your job. You will not get published. If you try to help someone else publish, you can lose your job. And if you just even smell of anything that seems like God or creation, you, you will, your job is in jeopardy. So this is why our schools are so important. And our universities, elementary schools, and uh, so on and so forth, and our churches, where we can continue to equip our young people with good, solid thinking. We got a question already. Uh, I, so I love being interactive, uh, but I, I don't know if I have a microphone ready to go for you. I'll try to repeat your question because it's being recorded. Question, okay, okay, come. Yep. Yeah, that's often. Right. Right. 
So I have a comment from the audience here that says, is it a cop-out? Or it's unfair to bring in a well-known and well-tested scientist into a program and then to bring in a pastor, and that's not fair, right? And that's totally going to make Christianity, even though you got the coolest looking pastor you could, you know, out there. But, um, yeah, that's not fair. It's, it's not. And, and that's the thing. There, it's all subtle. Some of it's subtle, I should say. A lot of it's overt in that uh, what is happening to just make creation. And we need, that's why we need science. This is what compels me. We need to train our young people. This is why I appreciate being at Andrews to give them solid thinking. And you're going to go through some of that here in just a minute. Of how we can approach and counteract these arguments. And I think a lot of it's in chemistry. I'm a little biased in biochemistry. Um, because the, there's a lot of arguments going on in biology and a lot of them in physics, but you know, it, it has to cross over through chemistry because you can't have life without chemicals coming together. All right, so let me get in a little bit of thinking in terms of a chemist. So this is the argument that evolutionists have that we came out of um, the oceans as a single-celled creature. Well, it started in the oceans and we came out walking out as some fish or whatever. But what do you see here in the water of this uh, awesomely done PowerPoint here? This is me, my own PowerPoint imagery here. <laughs> what, do you, what, what, what kind of objects do you see there? What are they? Parts of a car. Parts of a car, yeah. And yeah, so we, we can see that and go, oh man, that lets a tire, you know. Okay, I should know more. My dad was a car mechanic. Uh, there's other parts to a car there. And, you know, if we were to see that, and all of a sudden, you know, if a car sort of drove out of the ocean, we would say, that is ridiculous. There's no way. I know how a car works. And how, those, how the engine and the wheels and the crankshaft and the pistons and the doors and the wheel. I know how all of that stuff together. And you can't shake a, a bag of these things, and they won't come together. Because we understand the design that goes into an automobile or a lot of the electronic and engineering things that we have. And so this is ridiculous to us. But when it comes to chemistry, we go, okay, I don't know, that stuff's too hard. There's a few people that understand it. So I want to help you to see a little bit more about design, chemistry-wise. But see, it's not just the fact that, let's say, a car drove out. It's a car that can replicate itself. And we'd say, man, that, that is even farther fetched, further fetched than all of, of just having a car come out of the ocean. But having a self-replicating car, as awesome as that would be, I mean, that is so strange and foreign to us because we understand that kind of engineering, that kind of design. When it comes to chemistry and biochemistry, uh, stuff's too hard. It's just stuff just happens. Because it's happening around us. And so we just think that it just happens. All right, let me ask you another question. So this is one of the simplest organisms, living organisms that we have, a bacteria. I want to start having you think about chemicals as ingredients. How many chemicals or ingredients do you think is in the simplest organism, uh, a bacteria? Start shouting out some answers. What do you think? We got hundreds, thousands, and millions. So you guys are really good. At least throwing out some, uh, uh, I like to throw out those numbers. Sometimes people say 10 or 12. Uh, if you're in the thousands, you are getting close. So there's roughly in the simplest organism, okay, there's a lot more when you get into uh, humans and you know, living creatures, larger creatures, there's around 4,000 individual chemicals that come together, all right? And so uh, there is a lot going on there inside of a cell. Now what's uh, challenging about all, all of these things have to come together at the same time. And I think, I can check my slides here real quick. <laughs> So when we think of chemicals as ingredients, ah, we can start to think about that in a, little, in a little better detail. So just a little background, I mean, the early cell, so when Darwin published his book in 1859, they just thought the cell was a little soap bubble with a few chemicals in it. And that is not what we now know about the cell. And so in fact, we could say chemistry hadn't really uh, established itself as a legitimate science at that point. It was still kind of alchemy in the late uh, or in the 1800s and before and so the periodic table which is we all associate with chemistry was published in 1869 it was 10 years after and then it really wasn't used until uh, a good five ten years later and people oh they, they, there's patterns there 
And so we have chemistry coming along, and it, that coming along afterwards. And so now with chemistry and biochemistry, when we look at a cell, oh, that looks like a factory in there. And so it's really easy to establish that, oh yeah, if it's just a cell with a few ingredients, that could just, that could pop out of uh, the oceans. That's not too hard. Yeah, I could see where that thinking could, could take off. But now when we look inside the cell, it is so complicated. And it's not because it's complicated that God had to do it. And that's why you have to study it further to see how these things work, <laughs> okay? And that's a lot of good biochemistry they're going to get into. But let me, let's think about ingredients, though, when it comes to cooking, because that is chemistry that most of, it, well, most of you guys probably do. And, I'm, you know, it's, that's why it's great um, to get students and young people in, involved in cooking, because then we can teach them something about chemistry. All right, so let's talk about uh, making cookies. How many ingredients does a chocolate chip cookie have? What do you think? Shout out some ingredients. Eggs. Or egg substitute. Well, flax seed's good. Uh, what else? Flour, salt, sugar, chocolate chips, of course. Yeah, you need some kind of oil or shortening. Nuts, if you want. Baking powder, baking soda. So there's about eight, maybe nine, depending on how you make it. How come I don't have cookies jumping out of my house that often? Because you need a designer to come in somewhat. We call them bakers or chefs or your spouse or your kids. Someone needs to go with intelligence and bring those ingredients together. And we often say, all right, I got the ingredients. That's enough. No, 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 no. Chemistry, we need to know more. So when you're making a cookie, it isn't just that you have the ingredients, right? Because I have all the ingredients, but I don't have cookies popping out of my kitchen. So we have to do more to it. And life is, and everything that's in life, that's chemistry that we see, all has to be thought of in the same way. Oh, we found how to make, you know, uh, there, there's researchers that made some of the uh, early amino acids and in a, in a, made it in a flask with some lightning. It's the Miller-Urey experiment. Oh, we got amino acids. We've got all the ingredients for life. They did not, but they had some of them. And everyone's going, yeah, that's awesome. We made the early ingredients in life in a beaker. Yeah, but they, they're going to forget all this other stuff that needs to take place. What is the other things? Well, we, we need the right ingredients. This is true. You don't want wrong ingredients in there, although that's kind of fun. You should do that. You should put some other things into cookies. Put ketchup in there, mustard. Those actually don't mess it up too much, okay? But it's not only just the right ingredients. Try messing around with the amounts. You almost, it's so hard to, but I like doing that. All right, let's just dump in a bunch of salt and see what happens. Or let's leave out an ingredient, see what happens. And we start to realize, oh man, yeah, we kind of need to bring, there's some, there, you can play around with the ingredients a little bit, but you can't mess around with it too much. It has been, you know, perfected over the years. Uh, chemicals have a shelf life to them. You know, those year old eggs in the refrigerator, probably not the best thing to be using in your cookies, right? So chemicals don't all, not all of them last forever. So there's a time, there's a shelf life to them. You need to do them in the right order. I mean, me being the chemist and the guy, I'm, I'll just throw all the cookie ingredients together. I just, the wet and dry didn't matter, just threw them all together. And I actually failed at making cookies that way because I would have a bite of sugar and I'd go, man, that's great, and then a bite of baking soda. Ugh. And so you have to mix them correctly. And this is the same thing we find in, in uh, chemistry is that you have to mix them. They can't just sit there. They have to be mixed somehow. They have to have heat at the right, it's, oh, okay, well, uh, we'll hear, oh, we got the sun, and that's enough to provide all the energy to create life. Yeah, but I have the oven, and I can turn it on in my kitchen, and I still won't have cookies popping out. Why? Because they have to go in at a certain time, in a certain temperature, and they have to come out. You can't make cookies at a lower temperature and let it sit longer. That does, still doesn't work out. So this is how we think from a chemistry perspective is, you know, uh, heat and time, the ingredients, and we have to bring all of these together. You guys know this because you, you bake things, you make things. And chemistry is no different. We have to think of all these. Yeah, we'll give a free pass to a lot of scientists. Who are like, well, we figured out, you know, that a, a comet is carrying, you know, a little bit of carbon compounds, and that's how life got started. No way. I mean, how did they all come together? You've got to give us more details and more information. And, but, you know, we, we say, oh, that's enough. Life got us started because it came from a comet or something. And that's not fair. So I encourage you to go play around, have your kids mess up the cookies. And it's really hard. You, you don't want to, but it turns out it's, it's pretty easy to mess them up and kind of fun. 
And so, so to me, that's chemical design. And so I want to boil it down even uh, further into a simple concept that I'm working on. And when it comes to making things, can we see evidence of design if there, when, we, when we think about what happens if I put in too much or if I put in too little? Because a designer knows how to go in and put in the right amount. And we'll often see that there's barriers for chance. Chance can't get to these, these uh, things that we're trying to make, but a designer can because they know what it's trying to be made. So we often say moderation is good, and I want to be stronger than that, because we know from science and from medicine and things, you know, we say, oh, vitamin C is good for you, so if it's good, then take tons of it. Well, we might be okay with vitamin C, but you can't do the vitamin A or vitamin E or vitamin D, those fat-soluble vitamins. So we learn from medicine, at least, there is the right amount. And if you too much is bad and too little is bad. And that's the same thing I see with chemical design. I want to show you that here with, um, with our air. Now I have actually talks for uh, the components of our air, but today we're just going to talk about the air in general. Okay. In fact, um, I'm going to go quickly through this slide because I want to ask you: Do you know what the uh, well? Is there evidence for design in our air? And I'm going to show you what would happen if we had more air and less air. Okay, and how that impacts life. All right. Do you guys know what our air is made out of? I'm going to. We're going to. I just want to see what you guys know. What is the what is the uh, ingredient at the highest levels in our air? Uh, I got lots of nitrogen. What does anybody think? Oxygen. Uh, so you got, I think I have some good scientists in here. It is actually nitrogen. But now, does anybody know in dry air, which means there's no water, because water varies a lot. And uh, I think down here, most of the water is in the air. It feels like. And ah, uh, oh, the humidity. Um, does anybody know what percentage of nitrogen is in it? Yeah, you guys are cool. All right, you guys are good. You guys are great. All right, I asked this to students coming in and, 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 and their parents, and, and nobody, it, it's rare that anybody gets it right. You guys are awesome. You know, we, 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 we think about what we put in our mouth, right? Oh, it's got too much sugar, it's too much fat, too much salt. We think about that, but do you guys ever think about what you breathe? That's going in your mouth every minute. And when we do, we're going to find some amazing things. 78% nitrogen, what's next? Oxygen, does anybody know the level? 21%. I have a talk to why each one of these is important, the percentages, and what happens if it's too high, too low. I'm not going to go through that today. Oh, man, that was the hardest one, and I just threw it up there. Argon is there at 0.9%. Does anybody know what the fourth ingredient in our air? Not ozone? CO2. All right. CO2. Now, it was at 0.035%, uh, half half a century ago, and now it's up to 0.04%, and this is where the whole global warming issue is coming in. Now, I want to say that the, the world is making my argument for me, because our world's going to be messed up if the CO2 levels get too high. Well, that's what I'm saying. If everything, if there is a certain ratio in there, and I think God built in tolerances, how much? I'm not sure, and we may be pushing it. I don't know. That's what we need to figure out. And we need to be careful. We need to be good stewards. And that's actually one of the things I like to bring up in, our, in one of the uh, talks. I think it was on day seven, how we need, or day six, we need to be good stewards of our planet. And so that means we need to know how it works. And so all of these make up nearly 100% of all, and I like to show it visually, 78 out of 100 bottles would be nitrogen, 21 bottles out of 100. And so most of our air, those two ingredients. So what would happen if we had too much or too little of those? So I'm not going to talk about that, but just to know that there's a lot more, and I've dug deep into all of those, and it's fun and interesting to me, and hopefully to some others. And we can learn so much about God, but I just want to talk about the total amount. See, when we think about air, we think of, these, are, these are gases. They're, they're, they're molecules. They're, they're widely separated, and they, they can float around. And so we think about them in terms of the ingredients. We also think about the total weight that's there. And that weight is given uh, usually some kind of a pressure you know, like atmospheres. So we call the Earth's weight of the air, we call it one atmosphere, because that's how much it all weighs. Now, just to give you some context, as we're learning about other planets, especially in our solar system, it gives some uh, context to our, our planet here. So I'm learning how to be a, an astrobiologist a little bit and what's happening. So you go over to Venus, which is next door to us here, closer to the sun, and it has mainly two main ingredients, carbon dioxide and nitrogen. But interestingly enough, the weight of that atmosphere is nearly 100 times the weight of our air. So it's a lot thicker on that planet. It's almost like swimming. If you were to, able to be on, on land there and walk through Venus, it'd be almost as thick as water. Not quite, but 
it, it, it would feel very differently to us here. You go over to Mars, and this is what I'm trying to visualize it here. So here's, here's you just think about the weight of the air in Venus. It's uh, way heavier, just a lot more molecules on top in Venus. Earth, we're here at one atmosphere. And if you go over to uh, Mars, it almost has no atmosphere. Most of it's carbon dioxide, what they found of it, a little bit of nitrogen in there, but it is 100 times less dense than our air. And this is why you can't send probes to Mars without trying to figure out how to make them land because here on Earth we're like, oh, throw out a parachute, that will slow you down. Why? Because it's catching the air molecules as it's going down. You throw a parachute on Mars, there's very little to catch. Now they're still going to throw a parachute, they're basically bouncing things off the, off the surface of Mars. There's no air there. Okay? Well, what does that have to do with life? What does that have to do with it? What happens if Earth had more or had less? So that's what I want to demonstrate to you now. So we're going to do a few demonstrations here. Just to, I want to help you to see the air. And that's what I have up here. And what happens if we had more or we had less? And this is what's fun to do with kids. And so uh, I'm going to do this one here first. So oops, it's a little wet in there. This is a multi-purpose one. Now, you don't need this little arm in here. I'm going to use this for two things. That's why it has an arm. You'll see here. And so this is just a little tissue paper I've wrapped with uh, uh, a little bit of tape so it stays together. And uh, what, does anybody know what's inside of this right now? Yeah, there's air in there, right? So, I mean, and so just to prove, you know, so this can go in. I'd like uh, someone to try to blow it in, though. And you were here first, so I'm going to give you the opportunity. Just go ahead and blow that in there. <laughs> All right. Now, this is not that hard. Now, <laughs> and I'll do it up here for everybody and for the video. All right. So I'm just going to blow that in there. Why is that not going in? I mean, I can, look, it, go, it just falls right in there. How come we can't blow it in? Does anybody know why? Uh, not quite, but it does have to do with pressure. So anytime you blow, you're lowering the air pressure. Moving air lowers it. So it's called the Bernoulli effect. That's how airplanes fly. You can somehow get air to move. So when I do that, I lower the pressure on the, on, the, on the outside, and then you have the regular pressure here, and it just pushes it out. So it's kind of like making it by, your, by lowering it on the outside. So that one's fun to do. And this kind of flask seems to help. It's called an Erlenmeyer flask. This is a sidearm. All right, so that one's a lot of fun. And then now I take this old, has anybody seen this? What is this? See, this is fun because you're like, oh, tornado. Kids love this. They can just sit there and go, oh, look at the tornado. It's so awesome. Well, this is great. You know, we, we see the water. It was, I just have water in there with um, some food coloring. And purple's becoming a, a favorite of mine for a variety of reasons. But, uh, so I mixed some red and blue together and made it purple. But what else is in there besides the water and the, and the food coloring? Yeah, there's definitely air. And if I go a little bit slower. Now, you saw the water go through. How come it's not going through very fast now? What's holding it up? The air pressure. And you can see the air is trying to get up. You see, a, so a tornado, especially in this case, and plumbers all know about this, that vortex is not just letting the water down fast, but it's allowing the air to come up through the middle. Because it has to have a way for the air to get through. The air is there. We can't see it, but we need to be trained to see it and to appreciate it. So it goes down because the air has a good way to come back up. All right. Now, there's a lot of air out there. There's so much. So uh, this one's a fun one, too. Uh, if you guys can't afford a uh, squirt bottle for these nice warm summers, you can uh, do something like this. So someone put a, two liter, or a nail inside my two liter here. But if I remove this, the water's not coming out. Why? Well, it does come out, by the way. It'll evaporate, maybe. Uh, there's a lot of humidity here. What's holding it back? Yeah, the air is holding it back. I've created a little vacuum in here by letting some of it out, some of the water out. And it creates a lower pressure. And the weight of the water and the low pressure in here equalizes the air pressure on the outside. The air, our air is amazing. And so it can hold it up. Let's put my nail back in there. A little bit leaks out as I shake it. That's all right. Now, another way to show the air pressure and the strength of it, what it can do is I have another device up here, this little metal thing. Does anybody know? I don't know if you can. I'll try to hold it up. Does anybody know what this is? Ah. Not a, it's actually not an air compressor. It's close. It works the other way. It's a vacuum pump. 
Now, mechanics use this one uh, to help dry out, and you'll see why, uh, water from air conditioning lines. And so it's nice and portable, and get an Amazon for maybe around 100 bucks. So if there's science teachers out there, it's a good one to get. All right, so what I'm going to do, so it removes the air. That's all you need to know. I'm turn it on. Now I'm going to remove the air out of here, and let's see what happens. So what's going on? Why did that crush like that? Yeah, the air outside. There's so much air that's around us. It is crushing that. This is how I crush my cans. Let's see if I can do it. I gotta get the opening covered. All right, so that's a lot of fun. 100 bucks for that. Now it's a little heavy. Uh, I was doing a lot of these at summer camp. So I, I, I had them with me and we just kept them coming. All right, let me show you a couple videos of the power of the, of the air pressure that some other people have done. Now, what's going to be shown here is there's a way without using a pump like that to get rid of or at least lower the air pressure inside of a container. You put a little bit of water in it, you uh, boil the water, and then quickly cap the container. Uh, as it cools down, it will lower the pressure inside. So that's what these guys are doing. They're gonna boil some water inside of a 55 gallon drum. That's what's happening there. They quickly seal it. And then you gotta let it cool down. Uh, it's basically water vapor in there now. It's gonna cool back down into liquid water, which basically lowers the pressure in there. And bam, the air pressure crushes that 55 gallon metal drum with no problems whatsoever. And some other, uh, some Japanese scientists and actually Mythbusters have done this next experiment that you're going to see in this video, where they um, they take a <laughs> a tanker car and do the same sort of thing. They remove the air, and they're able to crush a huge tanker car that has had the air removed. Wow! Look at a crush. Look at crush that air. That is amazing. We have air, we have air pressure, it is amazing. So what is it all for? Why, why, why do we have so much air? And why isn't it more, why isn't it less? Let's think about it. So this next experiment we can all do together, put your hands together and rub them really hard. What do you feel? What, why, why do you feel heat? Friction, that's right. Ah, not that we need more heat, right? Oh boy. So anytime, and the way, the, the way we gotta think about it is anytime molecules, it doesn't matter if they're liquids or they're solids or they're gases, when they're rubbing up against each other, they create friction, they create heat. Well, what is that good for? Well, for our atmosphere, it has a lot to do with this picture up here. Does anybody have an idea what this picture is trying to show? It's not the sun, actually. This is something flying through the air. I'll show a few more pictures. Yeah, these are meteors. I don't want to talk about one in particular, uh, but there's meteors that are coming through our atmosphere all the time. What's happening? Well, as they rub, as, the, as these rocks are flying through our atmosphere, they are rubbing against the air molecules that are there, creating friction, which burns them up. In 2013, there was a very large meteor that came into our planet, and uh, it burned up mainly, and this is the size of it when it landed. Actually, I think I can just go right into our video here. And so there's some nice, um, I gotta click it again, yep. So this is some footage from a Russian uh, camera here with this asteroid going by. Thankfully, I don't think anybody was really hurt. Где-то упал. Слышишь? Это, это знаешь, что было? Это он сверхзвуковой. Это похоже астероид. Speak a little Russian. I need, I need that word. I hope they're not saying anything bad. If, if anybody knows Russian and they're saying something bad, please don't say Это звуковая волна. Астероид. Реально. Сегодня какой-то астероид должен быть. So the asteroid is just zooming through the air. What, where are all those booms from? The sonic booms from? The, the air is heated, right? Just like lightning, it heats up the air and we get thunder. 
That is heating up the air, creating these sonic booms, and that is setting off the car alarms, breaking windows, and that was the main damage that happened. And it ended up, you know, making a little bit of splash. Uh, it started off as the, as the size of a bus, they think, in our upper atmosphere. And it, it was, uh, I don't know how big uh, it was at the end, but it um, maybe the size of a basketball or something. Now, we're, we're all worried, and as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson told us, we should be worried that we're going to get killed by an uh, asteroid impact any time. Or at least he's very worried about it. And, uh, and there's other uh, people, like astronauts, and I'm going to show you in this next video, they, they're starting to catalog how strong these explosions are, and it's quite amazing. So I've got a little video here from a group of astronauts that are forming a company to create a device to look for these uh, uh, you know, life-killing asteroids that are out there. So let's take a look. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization monitors the Earth around the clock, listening for the infrasound signature of nuclear detonations. Between 2000 and 2013, this network detected dozens of massive explosions in our atmosphere. But not a single one of them was caused by a nuclear weapon. The actual cause, asteroid impacts. Between 2000 and 2013, there were 26 recorded asteroid impacts on Earth, ranging in energy from 1 to 600 kilotons. For comparison, the nuclear bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945 exploded with an energy of 15 kilotons. Most of the asteroids shown here exploded at too high an altitude to cause damage on the ground. They do remind us that asteroid impacts are not rare. An asteroid large enough to destroy an entire city hits the Earth on average once a century. Because we don't know when or where the next major impact will be, our current strategy for dealing with asteroid impacts is blind luck. But we can change that. Early warning infrared space telescope for tracking asteroids would give us many years to deflect an asteroid when it's still millions of miles away. The next great space mission is protecting the planet. Join us. All right, how, ma how many uh, people knew that there was 26 nuclear sized explosions happening in our upper atmosphere? You didn't know that? I didn't know that until I watched it. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Well, how come we didn't know about it? Where were they happening? In the upper atmosphere, right? They're burning up and they're being disintegrated. Our next great, great mission is to protect the Earth? Well, well wait a second. Nuclear-sized explosions are happening twice a year and they're not landing on us. We don't have to go around going, well, you know, we might lose Houston this year. It looks like there's an asteroid heading to it. So there goes Houston in a nuclear-sized explosion. I, I don't, nobody's worried about that. And they burn up. Why do they burn up? Because we have an atmosphere that's protecting us. And so I think it's very disingenuous of Neil deGrasse Tyson to be so afraid of asteroids when they're happening all the time and they're not, and they're not, they're not hitting us. Our air is a great shield already. And to say that there isn't something protecting us is, you know, it's like the little kid who has everything and is complaining about one little thing that they're missing in their toy box. But they have everything else. We are being protected. What if we had more air? Man, that would, okay, so now we go into design. What if we had more air? It actually would be better, right? Because it would create more friction and things would burn up and we would even have to worry less about meteors. Oh man, more. God, why didn't you put more air into our planet? You could protect us more. Well, that's because he's thinking about some other things and I'm gonna show you that next. And now if there was less, we're like, thank you Lord for not putting less air because that means we would have more of these strikes landing and hitting the surface of the planet and wiping out life. But that doesn't happen that often. Okay, it, it, sure, that some of them do hit, and we do have to worry about some of them. But it's very rare, and mainly they are just make some cool videos on Facebook. Oh, meters went by, and we got caught them on some cameras. But we're, we're really not that worried for our lives. So less air, for, in this case, would be bad. More air, we think, Lord, why didn't you put more air? We could be better protected. I'd have more oxygen to breathe, and life would be so great. 
Well, because God has to think of some other things when he's making a planet. Let me show you. All right, so what else does air do for life? And that's what I, and our last topic here for this. What one substance do scientists look for when they're going to go look for life on another planet? And they're sending out our spectrometers and we're looking at these other planets. What one chemical substance do you think they're looking for? What's that? Carbon. No, not carbon. Oh, I, I, I did hear it. Let's see if it revealed. Oh, chocolate. No, they're not looking for chocolate. I, I, although they probably should, then we know advanced life does exist if there was chocolate. Uh, no, they're looking for water. When there is water, there is life. But we know there's a lot more. Okay, but they're looking for what? I, I would argue they should look for something else, but uh, that's another topic for another time. So water is what they're looking for. Our planet's full of water, at least on the surface, maybe in the interior. Um, and liquid water, and that's the key here, liquid water, not steam and not ice, liquid water is what's needed for life. That's all the chemical reactions that takes place in living organisms. Uh, we need liquid water. So it is the single most important ingredient for life. So now we gotta start thinking, how are the air and water connected? Let me show you. So this is a little video I just did in lab real, real quickly. It's not too hard. You guys have done this in your kitchens and perhaps in laboratories. What am I doing with this water right here? Yeah, I'm boiling it. That is water right there that is uh, heated and it's turning into a gas and it's leaving the flask. That's boiling water right there. Now the boiling point of water is connected to air pressure. And many of you know this already, but we just have to think through it and appreciate what's there. So at, at sea level, when you got a full atmosphere sitting on top, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And if you're going to, to uh, Denver, which I think right in the city center is 5,280 feet, one mile up, mile high, water will boil at 94 degrees Celsius. The boiling point of water changes as you go up in elevation. And so I calculated some of the numbers going up here. So at the top of Mount Everest, when you're really high up and there's very little air up there to breathe, there's very little atmosphere, water boils at 70 degrees. So the amount of air that is uh, on top of water affects its boiling point. In fact, I'd like to show that here. What would happen to water if we were to actually take away a lot of the atmosphere? <clears throat> so I have some water here, and I have strategically left enough of it. And so just to prove that it's water and not playing with you, I'm going to drink it because I'm actually a little thirsty. All right, now I'm going to put water in my flask here. So it's not as anything special, although I think water is extremely special. And uh, I'm going to put some water in here. And I'm going to remove the air out of this. And we're going to see what happens and see for ourselves the effect that air has on the boiling point of water. Now I've got to put a lid on it and I've got to take this out and we're going to turn it on and we are going to remove the air out of here. What is happening to that water? If you may need to stand up. It is boiling. Now please, this is a time for audience interaction. If you want, if you've never experienced that, you come up and touch boiling water. Because you don't get to do that very often. Come, come feel for yourself. What is happening? You see at room temperature, when you remove all of the air, the water boils. Because there's enough energy in the air right now to boil it. You gotta feel it, you gotta, you gotta experience it. So this is why there's different cooking directions in Denver and other places that are at higher altitudes because the water is cool, cooler than what it is when it's boiling at a, uh, when it's boiling down at a low uh, elevation. That is cool, you, you gotta, I mean, it's cool in the sense that it's awesome to look at but it's also uh, cold to your touch. It's actually getting cooler as it evaporates the water. Now you got now, now remember what was happening with when I took the air out of all of these other things. There's a lot of pressure on this on this on this vessel right now. And so the round design and it has really thick walls is keeping it from imploding. I was practicing before on a on a real I had a really large one of these, but it had thin walls. And I thought, well, it probably would stand up and I, I removed the air from it and it imploded, which is kind of cool, uh, but kind of dangerous. So uh, we gotta be careful. I've tested this one out many times, and so it's holding up. So the air pressure then is directly related to the boiling point of water. And I can let the air back in and it becomes liquid water again. There's a lot of amazing things that we can learn from that. 
So the amount of air that we have controls the boiling point of water. These are simple things that Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm sure, knows, but he has forgotten. And he's misleading the public in a lot of these things. So how are air and water linked together? It's the wind's weight, the air pressure, that controls the boiling point of water. So we can think of all of the, uh, air, actually calculator, other people, there's about four teratons of molecules, I think nitrogen mainly, that's there. So we demoed, we already did that. We showed what happened, water will boil. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the whole water cycle is based on the amount of air pressure that's here. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we have, uh, if there was, let's just think about it. What if we had more uh, air or less air? What would it do to our water cycle? Well, if we had more, which we thought would be awesome because it would give us uh, better protection, if we had more air pressure, what it would do is increase the boiling point, making it harder to boil water, which would make it harder to create evaporation and to move water up in the clouds if we had a, a, a higher air pressure. So a designer of our planet has to think about, if I, oh, if more air is good, but I'm going to be messing with the boiling point of water. And, I, and so there's some variance there that's allowed, but you could really mess up the water cycle. And if there was less air pressure, then we would have a lot more water into the atmosphere, which we are already uncomfortable with right now. But water is a great greenhouse gas. It's 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And our planet would overheat just by having a little bit less air pressure. So the air pressure is very finely tuned to the boiling point of water, which is finely tuned to protection that our planet gets. And everybody, I feel like, is just missing this. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, come on. We are being protected right now. And, it, and, and the best explanation we have is it just happened. This is an accident. We got lucky. We're in the one, we're the, man, we're so lucky, it's amazing. And, we, and I think we, are, we should be appreciative of our, of our planet. But not only does our air protect us, but our air is being protected. And this is one of the overlays I think will be awesome to do. And this is a whole other discussion, but you just take my word and that uh, we have an amazing magnetic field that is surrounding our planet because, uh, well, and it has to do with our planet having the right temperature inside. And that's a whole other talk about the solids in our planet. But we have an iron core and it's kind of moving around. And as it moves, it's, it's called a dynamo effect and it creates this magnetic field. That magnetic field then, as the solar wind is just blasting away from the sun, that they, the, the solar wind and all these uh, uh, ionized particles and all this radiation that's coming towards Earth gets deflected around it. And that protects the air. So not only is our air protecting us, we have something protecting the air. And I can tell you, the more you look into this, you're going, I, I can show you so many things about water and about air and oxygen and ozone and carbon dioxide. And each one of these are not that hard to just take a time a little bit to teach what they do. And then we can appreciate this. I've done this for gen ed students at Andrews. And they got it. They weren't scientists. I've done it for seventh graders. Man, they can figure it out too. We can figure this stuff out and we can see how God made this world and we can be so appreciative of what he did. A lot of what, I, what I'm talking about today is just what he did on day two. He's just putting in this atmosphere that's finely tuned for life. Yeah, is it an accident? I don't know. We're just a lot of coincidences that are happening. So our, even our air is being protected. And all of this is to create water. And I have another talk on water. This would almost be a class on water. It is so unique. Liquid water... Water itself is so unique from any other molecule out there. I'm, I'm trying to find anything that's similar to it, and I cannot. <clears throat> it's, it's size, it's, uh, it's just nothing close to it. And I have 14 uh, properties there that are listed right on out. Density, polarity, viscosity, that's melting and boiling point. There's nothing like water. You cannot go, well, I'll just we're going to put in some dimethylformamide and, and, and use that. No, there is nothing out there that seems to be even remotely close to the property of water. We need it. Our atmosphere, it, man, I can tell you how water is trapped on our planet. It's amazing. Uh, and we'll, that's a whole other talk for another time. I'm just letting you know that I've been thinking about this a lot. And I just I don't see anybody else talking about how well designed it is. We, they, I hear we got a cool atmosphere, and it's great, and it's finely tuned. That's all I hear. But we can go deeper and actually figure that out. <clears throat> and let's, just, uh, let's wrap this up here. When I look into, into Job here, I mean, even Job understood this connection here. It says, when he uh, gave the wind, and this is in Job 28, 25, when, when he, this is God, when he gave the wind its weight, even Job knew that the wind had weight. 
he apportioned out the waters by measure. You can see there's this connection already between wind and weight and waters and measure. The scripture has a lot of this already. We just need to keep looking. And he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt. God had designed all of this. This is not by chance. And the more we look, we're seeing more and more evidence of God's handiwork and what happens um, that's there. So I like to call this the wind's weight. The wind's weight. So we're building a planet here. Well, what would you do? Do you, do you come in with the air? Like, are you going to build people first? And go, oh, you guys got to hold your breath for four or five days until we bring in the air. Anyway, you know, the longest uh, anyone's held their breath is about 11 minutes, unless they do some oxygen uh, breathing. They can go up to 22 minutes or so. <clears throat> so we need, we, need, we need the oxygen, we need the air. So uh, when would the plants come in? Well, maybe we can bring them in later on. You know, but so there is the design to this, that what we see in the creation story, that you want to bring in the air that, that the animals and the creatures and the plants need, and you want to build in your protection system first. And so I think the creation story from a chemistry perspective makes perfect sense. On day two, after we, you know, on day two here, we, God is coming in with the air and just letting the air in. It's turning uh, uh, gaseous water into liquid water and separating the waters from the waters. So let's go to that. Okay, day two, let there be a firmament. Oh, I love that word, firmament. We often think of air as nothing, but we need to think about it as something that's firm. And there's substance to it in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from water. You saw it right here. When I let the air in, it divided the waters from the waters, the liquid water from the gaseous water. Our atmosphere is being built on day two in here, finely tuned for life. God made the firmament divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. God called the firmament heaven. So that heaven in this context is air, is the atmosphere. And the evening and morning of the second day, that finely tuned gaseous mixture that we need for life. Amazing. The right amount for life, for water. You can't argue with the thermodynamics of water uh, that we have the right amount. So I like to see God's signature when I start to think about <clears throat> what would happen if we had more, what if we had less, what would happen. And so I see a designer finely tuning these things for us. And I think others need to know about that. So God created a world that protects us. And that shows us his love. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to the argument. I see a loving God because I see a God that's protecting us from a lot of things that are out there, you know, not to talk about our immune system and everything else that's there. So this is just the beginning of what we can do, what I think I can do as a chemical missionary to get people excited about how God made this world and how we can show it, uh, others how it works. And then we'll appreciate what he's done. All right, and I think chemistry is cool too. Um, all right, so why is this important? Well, we know there's a lot of people, and maybe you have friends, and maybe it's a little bit of you, that uh, we see that science is eroding uh, at people's faith, at a creator. And I think it should not, and it, and it does not have to. I think we've been overlooking a lot of the obvious things that are there, at least from a chemistry perspective. And uh, we need to have a renewed look. We need more scientists, and I'm trying to raise up some more scientists that are going to look at uh, the world around us. <clears throat> I need a little bit of water here. And uh, I'll get some in a second. They're going to see this world, and we're going to see that is finely tuned for life. And the more we study it, the more we're going to learn about God, just like uh, Jeremiah said in 29, Jeremiah 29, 13. Let's go ahead and seek. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. When you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We need scientists that are doing that. Oh, yeah, it's good. See, I just needed water. Oh, man, the water's so good. Man, yeah, we, we got to look at water and our, and our world and our air, all totally different. And we shouldn't be afraid that when we go and look for God through science that, we're, that we won't find him. We will find him, and we're going to find him, and he's going to be sitting there going, see, I was there all along. You just need to look for me. A uh, la couple last pictures I want to show you. Did this happen by chance or by design? What do you think? Has anybody seen this before? What do you think? How many people think that just happened by chance? How many people thought that happened by design? Does anybody know what this is? This is a little display that's outside of Las Vegas. We, we saw it as we were driving um, out west uh, last summer, and I saw it way off the side of the road. This is actually a person standing right here. These are like 30 to 40 feet tall. And so these limestone rocks have been stacked on there by an artist that's called the Seven Magic Mountains, and apparently it's only going to be out for maybe another year or two. And I guess they'll take it down. Yeah, that's not, that's not natural. I mean, natural is behind right there. How about something else? 
Did that happen by chance? The, the, the winds and the rain and the erosion? No way. When we start, and we could, we, could, we could diagnose a lot of these things right here and go, all right, when I see certain ways, I, I can see that someone had to come in and design and put that. And there's a guy that likes to stack rocks up and, and, the, and the, just find them in the, on the beach and see how high you can stack them in different configurations and take beautiful pictures. This is done by an artist. It's awesome. The natural forces that are in our world cannot do this. We need a designer that comes in and, and to do these things. So, in summary, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just an optimist and I'm looking at the world in a unique way here. As the chemistry cat is saying, uh, you know, it says, uh, the optimist sees the, cla the glass half full and the pessimist sees the glass half empty and the chemist sees the glass full. Full of air and full of water. So this is, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, there's my, uh, my contact at Andrews and uh, Nathan Green's website. And I just want to, you know, just end by saying, um, you know, I just trying to figure out what it is to be a chemical missionary, make it exciting to students and whoever is willing to hear. Man, I am finding and seeing God in a whole new way. And every time I take a breath, I'm thinking, thank you, Lord. That is awesome. Now, it is so mundane to us because we haven't learned to look at it in the right way. So thank you for coming. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them, or, or as best I can. Yep. Well, you're very kind. <laughs>